the Groundhog Day. We're live. Good evening or good morning, brothers and sisters, students of the fire service, depending upon where you live in the world. I'm Bill Gustin, the oldest man in the room. Uh, March the 6th marked my 39th year with the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department in Southeast Florida. Our topic for today's hangout is going to be basement fires, which is a quite a complex subject. Uh, I expect it to uh, extend into at least three sessions, uh, talking with my brother, uh, Captain Mike Dugan, retired from the FDNY. We can look at it this from very from different points of view, size up, uh, awareness, uh, tactics, research, engine company operations, truck company operations. Uh, it is one of our most dangerous, dangerous and challenging fires, uh, especially when we're not even aware that we're operating above a basement. I want to mention our sponsor, Key Hose, at Key Fire Hose, KeyHose.com. I also want to give a shout out to their sales manager, Mike, Mark Lighthill, Mark Lighthill. Mr. Flow Test, I call him. There is no human being on this earth today that has conducted more flow tests on more different types of appliances, on more different types of hose, including every brand of hose, including Key, than Mark Lighthill. When you buy a product from Key, you're getting a product that has been tested extensively by experienced firefighters like Mark Lighthill. Uh, I've networked with this man for years. Uh, on matters that have nothing to do with fire hose, sometimes it does, but I can tell you, if he doesn't have an answer for you, you'll find somebody that does. Uh, before we begin our session today, I want everybody to remember Captain Bill Dowling, Iron Bill, from the Houston Fire Department, that passed away yesterday after injuries he received from a fire in a building collapse in... May of 2013. Fellas and ladies, it's not always an instant demise. It's not always an instant death. Right now, how many firefighters are slowly dying as a result of cancer that they have received on this job? How many firefighters that participated and were involved in 9-11 and the activities afterwards at Ground Zero are suffering because of those effects. It may not be as dramatic as an explosion, a backdraft, or a falling wall, but it is every bit as dangerous. It's every bit as deadly. So let's let's give a shout out. Let's remember Captain Bill Dowling, Captain Iron Bill from the Houston Fire Department in our prayers. So what we'll do now is um, we're going to have each participant uh, introduce themselves, and then uh, relate one of their most memorable, memorable or harrowing experiences with basement fires. And I will begin with the second oldest man in the room, uh, Captain Mike Dugan, retired from the FDNY. Go ahead, Captain Mike. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and thank you for uh, having me on, and thank you for Fire Engineering for uh, allowing us to do this, to come together to share some knowledge with you. I retired from the FDNY, and <clears throat> we're talking about basement fires, and basement fires, I've been to quite a few basement fires, and I remember one in particular where uh, we were the first to walk and ladder, and the first two engine got in before the truck, and made a push down the stairs and a young man who was in that company on the nozzle got burnt and he got burnt around the wristlet of the um of the coat and the burns were so severe that the tendons in his hands he ended up with a what i call almost like a claw now his wife was pregnant with their first child and doing things for that baby he was retired from the job because of it and doing things for that child you know, just buttoning clothes and things like that are going to become difficult. We have a duty to do a risks versus rewards and a size up and a full 360 understanding of what's going on and paying attention as we are getting ready to do this because basement fires 
are extremely, extremely, we're going down the chimney. And we can talk about different fires, uh, historic perspectives, where these things happen, where people get hurt or killed. And we have to understand that what we are doing is we are trying to make sure that we are doing the right thing to protect our members and the public. But at the same time, we are doing what is the best for us. Okay. So that would be a real good thing. Mike, before we introduce uh, Jason, could you just uh, give us an idea of what you're doing at FDIC? I am going to be uh, doing my class with my brother, Mike Galliano, in the classroom. We are going to be doing the uh, class of Firehouse Excellence. It's a leadership class for company officers in the field. I'm going to be teaching hands-on this year for the first time in a while. I'm going to be teaching um, with the I Women a class called Leverage, Force, and Aggression, Drills from the Street. And we are working to help people who are smaller in stature, might not have the same upper body strength that I have, not might not be as big as I am, to understand ways that they can use techniques to make their job easier for them. And again, my partner, Mike Galliano, and I are very lucky to be teaching with a young lady by the name of Katie Johnson out of um, Baltimore County. And we're going to be teaching the hands-on there this year. And uh, also we'll be on the radio and a few other things at FDIC. And so uh, it should be a lot of fun. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Brother Jason, could you introduce yourself? Let us know uh, one of your most memorable basement fire experiences. And then let us know what you'll be teaching at FDIC. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jason Holbelman from the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District, a battalion chief there and also co-owner of Engine House Training. And uh, FDIC, quickly, I'll be teaching Thursday afternoon, uh, one of those last time slots, uh, the Ten Commandments for the company officer off the fire ground. And uh, looking forward to seeing everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll be catching up with everybody at all the evening activities like the Brotherhood Bash and uh, the 5K, Courage and Valor 5K. So, um, look forward to seeing everybody. I'm going to take a lot of classes this year. Um, looking forward to that. But uh, as far as basement fires go, the one that's most memorable, it wasn't so much that it was a, a, a really bad fire in as much as it was a 12-unit uh, a apartment building with uh, a large basement. And these particular apartment buildings, a lot of people probably have them there access to the basements are not as obvious and they're not easy to get to. Uh, they're hard to deploy, especially a lot of turns to get to them from any door that you go in. A lot of them you've got to go into certain units to get to the basement accesses. Um, on top of that, uh, the basements were subdivided in basically like chicken coops almost. It was chicken wire and, and two by fours and stacked to the hilt. And uh, it was a situation where we had a lot of heat, a lot of smoke, um, but not real good signatures, really difficult to find the fire. And it took us, it, it took me almost a complete full bottle of not really doing a whole lot, but walking around trying to find this fire, uh, not really been able to vent it since we didn't know where the, where the, um, origin was. Uh, but it was, it was, and we've had several fires like that since. And, um, I don't know how many apartment buildings people think about having basements, but it's something that we have to deal with on a pretty regular basis. All right, brother Jason. Uh, and our friend uh, from Wichita, Kansas, in the Heartland, Mr. Sam Hiddle. Afternoon, gentlemen. Um, Lieutenant with Wichita, Kansas Fire. And at FDIC, I'm going to be fortunate enough to uh, participate in the Truck Company's Essentials class with Mike Champo. Uh, it's always a good time, a learning experience. I'm very fortunate and blessed to be a part of that. And then on Thursday, I get the opportunity to teach forcible entry wins are in the details where we go into stuff that goes beyond just inward outward doors and talk about why we fail and why we win at different forcible entry techniques. Will you be covering mag locks and electronic strikes in that class? We do, but it's uh, in no way would I consider myself an expert or even knowledgeable in regards to those. Um, the mag locks are a problem that we're facing you know we started seeing them on the exterior now we're seeing them built into doors we're um 
there's a lot of different approaches we can take to get through them. Um, personally, I know this sounds crazy, but I'd like to build an EMP. They work off 12 to 14 volts. If we could knock that power out, then we can get through, uh, particularly when we're trying to go through the building. But at the same time, there's tricks we can do to get through. And we'll talk about some uh, variations. I think we're going to get better at getting through them through the years. But right now, they are problematic for us, especially when you look at some of the earlier maglocks. They were about 450, 300, 600 pounds. And now we're up to about 6,000 pounds. Uh, you want to let us know about one of your most harrowing or memorable basement fire experiences, Sam? I, I would say the biggest one was an eye opener. Um, they're getting ready to dispatch something. Okay. Um, I would say the most memorable one was thinking that we were going to go through the front door, and once the 360 was done, realizing that that fire was through the basement, and had we gone through that front door, we would have found it, just not yeah. the way we wanted to. Yeah, you would have been first on the scene. So in other exactly. words, you would have experienced the phenomenon of through the door, through the floor. Exactly. All right, brother. And that's uh, an all too common scenario. Um, well, great, Sam. And uh, I'll be looking forward to your uh, attending your class that, um, and heckling you and intimidating <laughs> you at, um, at FDIC. And if I can annoy and make you feel more uncomfortable, then just let me know. <laughs> uh, kid, Sam. Just kidding. All right, I know you're a sensitive guy. And what about our next brother there? Uh, that should be uh, our bald, another follically challenged young man, but with a very symmetrical head, I must say. Thank you. Um, Dan Shaw, if you introduce yourself, let us know what you're teaching at FDIC and uh, your most memorable basement fire experience. Okay, good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Dan Shaw, as, as Bill said. Yes, I'm a follow key challenge. Uh, but I am Battalion Chief in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, I'm also Vice President of Traditions Training and fortunate enough to be the co-author of, uh, with my brother from another mother, Doug Mitchell, of uh, 25 to Survive. Uh, and that kind of leads into what we're fortunate enough to teach at FDIC this year. On Monday from 1.30 to 5.30, we're in the Wabash One Room teaching 25 to Survive, which is Looking at the most common fire we run, which is the residential building fire, and, and identifying those 25 most common errors we all make, uh, but then giving you 25 ways to correct those errors through simple tips, drills, techniques you can do in any firehouse. Uh, and then we are extremely fortunate enough again on the teach on Thursday at 1030. Uh, we'll be in the Sagamore 3, 4, and 5 room. Again, both these classes with my brother from another mother, Doug Mitchell. Uh, and we'll be doing first two residential fire concepts for engine and truck company uh, on, on residential building fires. Talking about residential building fires again, giving some tips and tricks on talking about uh, the challenges and how to overcome them. Um, as for you know basement fires, I mean, I think we all have uh, you know there's particular stories, but you know, what I would offer is more of a perspective because I think every basement fire I've been to uh, has raised the hairs on the back of your neck. But the perspective really is from uh, where I am now as a battalion chief in the 4th Battalion uh, and having some really great aggressive fire officers and firefighters. I go back from when I was a firefighter and was you know under the belief that I was invincible and that nothing bad would happen, so you have to get after it on basement fires, to now being the incident commander and wondering, my God, I have 40-plus guys who think they're invincible and, and have to go in and go after and get it. Uh, and kind of tempering that both because there is no other fire we go to which you are operating on top of a platform that's been subjected to fire for an unknown amount of time. Uh, and then you have to figure out the recognition and, and, and the proper tactics. So yeah, it's more of a perspective. I mean, every fire, basement fire I've been to, it's whether it's been a hoarding situation or they've been SRO single room occupancies where they've put foam across the top of the ceiling and cut out the stairs and they sublet it to, um, you know, people who they're just trying to get money out of and you have a fire down there. Uh, just a wide spectrum, but each one of them offers a different challenge, but it, it really does come back to uh, we, we can't lose focus on the fact that platform we're operating on top of is being attacked by fire. Uh, Dan, you sent 
the members of this panel a, uh, a snippet, a, a somewhat of a synopsis of the uh, SOP on, um, if I'm saying it correctly, SOP or SOG on basement fires. Uh, just some bullets. Mm -hmm. uh, most excellent. And Bill Carey, if you're watching, uh, I would like to ask both of you if we could make that uh, available to our viewers on the either fire engineering and or uh, fire rescue websites. Uh, it's, it's perfect for any officer. It's a good review uh, and it's, uh, it's very enlightening. So Dan, kudos to you. Uh, I also will be teaching in Prince William County, uh, Virginia uh, at the end of this month. And uh, I have been, uh, they sent me the SOPs for Northern Virginia. I know you've got your hands all over that, Dan, and um, all real good stuff, real good stuff. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Bill. I mean, so they're operations manuals, and our operations manuals are all written for the occupancy types. Uh, and each one of those occupancy types, the single family dwellings, strip shopping center, all have a basement fire tactic in there. And, you know, while I am very grateful uh, for, being part of that process this has been uh, a legacy document that has been in the works for 20 plus years of some just transcending innovative chief officers company officers firefighters who put this down and then we have the fortunate uh, ability to revise it every three years and update it to co the common stuff but uh, to your point i mean this has been a long-standing document it's just great to be a part of it because that document now parlays into our operations and it's a seamless process regardless of where you go in northern virginia Oh, very good, very good. Now, Clark Lamping uh, from the Las Vegas area, you and I had a discussion about basement fires. You said you never fought a basement fire. But in and fact, I mean, you fought some nasty basement fires, but in a different sense. Could you introduce yourself, let us know about your most harrowing below-grade fire, and let us know what you'll be teaching at FDIC. Uh, thank you, Captain Gustin. Clark Lamping from the Clark County Fire Department in Las Vegas. Uh, this year, uh, I was fortunate enough to be chosen to speak at FDIC for my first first time ever. I have a classroom session on Friday morning, and my classroom is polystyrene and poly products in building construction and what those are doing to the firefight. Um, during my research, I've discovered that uh, in an effort to make houses and buildings more energy efficient, we are sacrificing uh, fire fire blocking and we're replacing traditional building materials with synthetic materials to make the building more energy efficient. Unfortunately, the majority of these products that are, we're insulating these buildings with are combustible and it's increasing the fire load. And some of the things I found during my research is pretty scary. So I'm going to do a uh, review on some of this at my class. And being it's my first time, I'd appreciate it if you showed up. And uh, I love being heckled. I love heckled. I'm a fireman at the core. So, uh, Maximum heckling would be appreciated. <clears throat> um, so uh, we had a fire in a hotel basement. And in Las Vegas, you know, backing up what Captain Gustin said, we have very few basements in Las Vegas. We don't have a need for it because we don't typically have freezing weather in basements and property still relatively cheap. So we typically go from the slab up. So we don't have very many residential basements. But we do have hotel basements. Every single hotel has basements and sub-basements, and we have some hotels that have four sub-basements underneath them. We had a fire in a hotel basement once, and, and these basements are huge. These basements could be 100,000 square feet, and typically all of your utilities are in the basement, your laundry's in the basement, you have a lot of commercial kitchens in the basement, tons of storage in the basement, um, cleaning supplies, all this, the uniform shop, it's all in the basement. So we had a fire in a basement, and we did not know where the fire was. One a great resource we have is everything's covered by cameras. So we immediately go to the security office and we try to locate where the fire is via cameras, but there was so much smoke it obscured the view of all the cameras. We just picked the door and started stretching hose. And we unfortunately picked the wrong door. And by the time we were done, we had 500 feet of two and a half inch hose through this basement fire. And it turned out to be a laundry cart full of towels but it was that plastic cart. And by the time we finally got there, it was burned down to about 12 inches, smoldering the fire had put itself out. And we, we burned probably 200,000 calories humping 500 feet of two and a half through a basement. Clark, so, were there sprinklers in that basement? There were sprinklers in the basement, yes. No, no standpipe hookups though, no standpipe uh, hookups. Any firefighter 
that looks at a building and says, ah, oh, don't worry about that place. We'll never have a serious fire because it's protected by sprinklers, has never fought a nasty, smoky, dangerous fire in a sprinkler building with the sprinklers operating. Not an indictment of sprinklers. They have a remarkable performance record. But you're in la-la land if you think that sprinklers are going to prevent you from ever having a fire that could kill firefighters, kill civilians, and destroy a building, especially when you have uh, the residential buildings that are protected by a 13R sprinkler system. Clark, uh, a, while you're talking about plastics, insulations, and uh, facades, uh, a bulb went off in my head, a very dim bulb, Clark, but a bulb nonetheless. Like a Christmas uh, light. Last week, I have heard from Professor Dave Walsh, uh, who's the program chair for fire science at the Duchess Community College Fire Science Program in Poughkeepsie, New York. Not another word that rolls easy off the tongue, Poughkeepsie, New York. And um, Jerry Knapp. Uh, from a fire that happened, I believe, in Monsey, Monsey, New York. Uh, not a lot of fire, but a lot of nasty smoke and off-gassing from the thermal decomposition of uh, plastic uh, foam insulation. So I have the pictures, Clark. I will be sending them to you. As soon as you send me those valves, those standpipe valves that uh, you've been promising me, for the last uh, three months, then you'll get the pictures. All right, Chief Halton, are you there with us, sir? Yes, I am. Would you like to talk to us just a bit for some tidbits of wisdom? Yeah, and I do want to let Sam Hiddle know that I did notify the NSA uh, that he wants to create an EMP, which is probably an act of terrorism. <laughs> I'm just, I just had to go there, Sam. I thought that was. You know what? Um, when I started researching it, I actually got in touch with the guy at the ATF just to make sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would do that. <laughs> anyway, you, you know, basement fires I think are fascinating. I think that you know, anytime we talk about below grade operations, whether it's subways, basements, uh, manhole operations, you know, they're they're fraught with tremendous risk. Basements being probably the most uh, attended to uh, of of those subgrade uh, events. Um, as such, we've done a great deal of study on them. You know, there's the, uh, the NIST duel uh, work that's out there. Uh, our good friend Ted Nee put a simulation up on fire engineering uh, this year about attached garages. But many garages, we have to keep in mind too, can sometimes be below grade. You'll often see where they'll build a house on one plane and have the garage drop down just below. And I think you want to approach those as a basement. I think if we look back historically, in 1982, you had the Path subway fire which was a below grade basement type event that was a, a really a significant event in the fire service in terms of our learning about how a fire behaves uh, below grade. Um, my personal experience, one of my most dynamic fires I ever had was a, a church of the Latter-day Saints in Albuquerque, New Mexico. First two officer was a phenomenal character named Chris Chavez who had uh, just a, an uncanny ability to uh, assess fire conditions. He was in a really hard running uh, district and he uh, was really uh, a student of the game and paid a great deal of attention to uh, the buildings and their construction and, and uh, conditions on arrival and changes. Anyway, Chris uh, wisely, uh, I was the battalion chief at the time, advised me to go defensive uh, from his early assessment, which we did, although there was little fire showing at the time. But back then we did a ventilation kind of routinely and we took the lower um, casement style windows that you'll often see at kind of the grade level for basements of this church, which resulted in an incredible volume of fire er er erupting uh, from that basement area um, combined with the other fire that was happening in the church just to it totally, hell, hell we, lost, we, we lost the mineral rights on that building. We, we burnt that thing with panache. But um, I remember watching that fire activity uh, occur. Um, fortunately, none of our people were, were in the basement at the time or, 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 or near the, the fire behavior that we witnessed. Um, the other example of a, of a kind of a below grade uh, basement fire happened in a school 
that I was not at, but I saw the videos of that the Tulsa crews had, and it was a almost like a basement slash crawl space area uh, that that had a bunch of gases uh, that ignited uh, almost post event, causing a tremendous backdraft in, in that uh, particular area of the building. So. Uh, Bas basements uh, are, are fraught with tremendous difficulty. I think the, the approaches to them need to be really nuanced with uh, what level of fire condition you have, uh, what your resources are. And as Bill and, and Clark uh, spoke to earlier, some of these massive basements really can be fraught with peril, whether they're sprinklered or unsprinklered. So um, my experience with basement fires is, was mostly residential. The few commercials I had were were, it were, were interesting to say the least and, and taxing. So I, I think that uh, now knowing what we know about ventilation, they become even more problematic when you think about the energy movement in a basement, in a basement fire. And so uh, uh, it'd be interesting to hear what the rest of the crew thinks about the application of foam in these events. I think the, the Chicago guys do a great job. Uh, they basically just film with foam uh, as a suppression technique, which I think is really impressive. Um, and, and other techniques that folks here might want to employ. But I, I think this is a basement or one of those areas where uh, life hazard uh, in, 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 in your typical residential, you know, whether it's half the footprint or the full footprint, generally not, a, as Steve Massar would say, not really a survivable type of environment for the customer. So uh, I, I think for us as well. And I remember our early training, you know, all different ways of going down the stairs to avoid that you know, energy, that heat that was rising above you was, was fascinating. And I, I remember, I remember those drills and I remember doing that a few times. So, um, always, always a scary proposition when we talk about, uh, basements, but, um, great, great topic. Chief, I can't think of another type of fire that it is more critical to con conduct operations in accordance with an on going size up. In other words, what you do when you first get there may be, by all indications, the right thing to do. But we have to consider fire conditions and the incident time. As, a, as a Dan Shaw says, we're working on a platform that may or may not be protected by drywall, and it is being assaulted. And uh, we have to consider the effect that the fire is having on the structure, the effectiveness of our tactics and strategy. Let's don't keep doing the wrong thing for too long. And part of that ongoing size up is that constant evaluation of risk versus benefit or reward. I think uh, I think the the coal rain the coal rain fire that claimed the lives of uh, Robin Boxerman and firefighter Shara. Um, five or six years ago, and I apologize, I don't have the exact date, it was April five or six years ago, um, in Colerain, Ohio, it is a great example of, of, a, of a basement fire, um, which was extremely well involved, and, and yet to all appearances from the ground level going in, was very deceptive, and, and uh, f fascinating uh, study in fire behavior, uh, and, and, and what occurred there in terms of um, complex human systems, coming together with a complex technological system. And I think that I would just throw this out to the crowd. At FDIC on Wednesday at 1.30, uh, Dr. David Woods, who is a brilliant, brilliant man, the man who literally wrote the book on complex human systems and resilience is going to be giving a talk specifically for firefighters. Um, this, is a, this is a wonderful guy, incredibly talented and, 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 and brilliant man. So I'd highly recommend folks that are interested in things like basement fires and and uh, and deployment, as Bill just said, where you need to have that constant ongoing evaluation that they they take that class in because Dr. Woods, although not a firefighter, can clearly help you to learn how to better manage that communication of a complex event like a basement fire more effectively. Um, brilliant guy, incredible presenter. And it'll be Wednesday at 1.30 and during the general uh, classroom sessions at FDIC. All right, I'm going to give my most hazardous or harrowing experience. Uh, it has to do with an ongoing size up. People say, Gustin, you're in Florida. You don't have any basements. We got enough basements to kill us. And the problem is, is that we 
have fires in basements, we don't realize that we have a basement underneath us. And this has to do with the scenario that I'm about to tell you. It has to do with an ongoing seismic. I think it was Tom Brennan that says, where's the smoke? Well, it's, it's above the fire. Or where's the fire? It's below the smoke. Um, we're groping around in a large stucco and wood frame house. It's getting smokier and smokier from all indications, both on the inside and from the size up by a very wise and experienced battalion chief, Buddy Stevens. God rest his soul, died of job-related cancer. This is a man that saw heavy combat as a Marine in Vietnam, a leader, a gentleman, a fine family man. Well, he saved our lives that day because we're groping around in that smoke and it's getting worse. He pulled ourselves and Engine 7 out. We said, Chief, why did you pull us out? He says, hey, I got my two best companies groping around in this house. You've been in there for 10 minutes and nobody can find the fire. Something isn't right here. A few minutes after that, the entire floor caved in. It was loaded with tires, mattresses, stolen car parts. We would have all fell into a fiery abyss. It probably would have just burnt to death. So there is a size up is that Chief Stevens, God rest his soul, considered incident time, considered the effectiveness of our tactics, saw that it wasn't working, saw that the fire was somewhere and we weren't getting to it. it Time to stop doing the wrong thing for too long. Time for us to mention our sponsor, Keyhose. That's keyhose.com. There's been a lot of talk lately about uh, using hose smaller than two and a half inch uh, for standpipe operations. Some of your options is two inch hose, both with two and a half inch couplings and those without it. Uh, you want to deviate from using two and a half inch hose, you better know your limitations and you better know your capabilities of the hose. If you choose to use something smaller than two and a half, you better use a hose that has the greatest flow capability given it its size. So I would, if you're looking for an alternative, you're going to have to make that decision yourself based upon your systems, the age of your systems, the compartmentation of the building. That's a discussion for a different day. But if you are considering something smaller than two and a half, please look at key. Conversely, don't go cheap on smaller diameter hose because you'll eat yourself up with the friction loss. Uh, I will be teaching uh, a four hour workshop on Monday uh, on operations for newly promoted company officers. And this is a uh, uh, a shortened version of it, actually, about a 16-hour class that I teach to our newly promoted company officers. And I began this class years ago on the premise that I would ask experienced officers two things. Knowing what you know now, what would you do differently as a newly promoted company officer? And secondly, if you could speak to a group of newly promoted company officers, what advice would you give them? So, I'm going to be teaching this class uh, four hours on Monday. So, I get a message from my brother, Chief Rick Owen, from Melbourne, Australia. He says, all I can say, Bill, is that your class better be good. I'm not flying 21 hours and 10,000 miles to listen to a knucklehead. And he didn't say the word knucklehead, but it's a disparaging word that the Australians use every so often. Starts with a W. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. All right, we've got a lot to talk about. Mike, Dugan Captain Mike. Could <laughs> I think <laughs> Captain Mike. Yes, sir. To the research that was done at Governor's Island and at what I'm really particularly interested in. Research was good. But uh, to what extent has the FDNY adopted some of those findings into uh, their, their operating procedures? We have definitely put them into our operating procedures where we are going to 
look where the engines are going, look where the fire is, look what the conditions are. And it's also learning about this because I go back to what you said about that basement and falling into that basement. And I go back to August of 2006. And if you are a student of the game, you know that in August 13th, 2006, Arnie Wolf fell into a basement in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It took them 19 hours to recover his body. His partner, Kim, went the other way, and she survived, but they had to break out the windows in that home to get her out of that basement. They were above a terrazzo floor, a tile floor with a mud job, didn't know where the fire was, huge McMansion up in an area in Green Bay they call Players Row, where there, the, a lot of the NFL players live, big, big houses. And again, basement fire, killed Arnie Wolf. Two weeks later, two weeks to the day later, we had the dollar store up in the Bronx, where How, Howie Carplunk and Michael Riley, a U.S. Marine veteran of, of fought for this country, was a probie. They were in a dollar store. Fire, all of the weight on the floor. The fire was in the first floor. But all of the weight of the water and everything else, the basement collapsed because we nobody had seen what the basement was like. And it was that renovated basement where they had had structural damage from a previous fire and just catted pieces together. And the weight killed it. It doesn't only have to be a fire, okay? It has to be going above it for a fire with a heavy, heavy load, as you talked about, car parts, tires, other things on that floor, buildings, what is in there? Is the space designed for that kind of load? So we have to look at our basements and see the total picture and make sure we understand that when we're getting ready to put our people, commit our resources to this because the research is going to tell you specifics at a specific research fire but every basement fire i've ever been to has been a little different and it's almost like i call it that hazmat answer it depends because you don't always know you have to see what the fuel load is what the fire load is what the construction type is and all of these things and these all have to be taken into the incident commanders size up total picture and the company officers have to be communicating this information so if one officer sees something and another officer sees something and they communicate it to that ic he puts together that whole thing like your chief did and pulls you out so i think the idea of this is we all have to be totally aware of where we're going what it looks like what everything in that fire is part of Mike, you bring up a good point. You know, it may not be the fire in of itself that precipitates the collapse. I think we're all disciples here of Chief John Norman. You know, uh, uh, Daryl, you were looking at uh, his book right before uh, we got on air. Laundromats. Uh, if you've read his book, if you have listened to Chief Norman's lectures, they will pour a concrete slab that weighs several thousand pounds on a conventionally supported wood floor there you go there you go there you go who brought that up daryl you are something man <laughs> and the reason for the heavy slab is you've got these large um oh, oh, front loaders front loaders uh where you put in the laundry and it has tremendous torque and it would shake the dickens out of the floor if they don't um uh if they don't uh have it securely fastened uh in fact i got my phone ringing here uh in fact i think sam when he was younger used to play astronaut in one of these things and it may have stayed in it just a little bit too long inside of one of those machines but i'll let sam explain that to yourself uh, mike if i if i could just ex uh, expand a little bit um what did 
the FDNY learn in terms of uh, routes of attack at basement fires, understanding that this was these were rows and rows and rows of government constructed uh, townhouses, if I remember. Correct. And I think that uh, they did dispel some myths about it being uh, cooler once you got to the bottom of the stairs. And if you can't stay, uh, if you can't make it down the stairs, cover the top of the stairs. Uh, and then I think they, they had some event where the kitchen cabinets fell in because of uh, the fire fire. The fire followed the plumbing up into the walls behind the kitchen cabinet. Can you allude on that just a little bit? Well, it's not going to get cooler at the bottom of the stairs because you're in the only ventilation area in a lot of these basements that you're going to get out. You're going to be in the chimney. If you're creating steam, you're creating more volume of material that's going to be coming up that stairs and it's going to be coming at you. Okay. So your, your whole idea is going to be, how are you going to be able to get water at the source of the fire? Can you take out a window? Can you hit a, can you hit it from the exterior? Can you do that? Getting down the stairs, Again, I remember being told, don't go down. If you go down the stairs, don't open a line until you get everybody off the bottom, off the stairs. Everybody gets down. You go down uh, facing backwards. And, you know, the stories of the guys tucking the nozzle under their arms and going down backwards with the nozzle flowing. They got down. Yes, they did. But, again, at what cost? Okay? You are going down the chimney. You are going down the barrel of the gun. And if it is invented, and at the point you start making that move down there, someone vents it, and you are on the wrong side of that. If you are a student of the game, we were talking about this before the program, look at the Cherry Road Fire in Virginia, and they were um, great companies that were there, and the Cherry Road Fire, um, and was I wrong? Was that Maryland or was that Virginia? Uh, Washington, D.C. D.C. DC. Thank you. But the great companies that were there and the nozzle man never got a chance to get the nozzle opened at the top of the stairs to protect himself. Two members died. It's available resources. Look at this. Is it worth that? Is this basement fire worth that? Okay. The tactics have to be uh, involved with the current fire conditions, the number of people you have. Listen, New York City, we got more people than we know what to do with to throw at these things. We can stretch lines to other places. If you're in a small uh, rural area, you're in a small um, suburban city, and your resources aren't coming, your secondary engine isn't coming for a while, you're going to have to figure out a way you can get water on the base of that fire to start cooling before you make that attack down that stairs. And you have to understand what the construction is. We can go into, you know, Lieutenant Halliday in the New York City Fire Department at the top of the stairs. The fire blew out. He was at the top of the stairs, burnt horrifically, thought he was dead. Okay. Again, this happens frequently. And my question is to all the people, how many people do we rescue from these basements? Good point, Captain Mike. Dan Shaw? Could you allude on the wind-driven event that occurred, I believe it was in Prince, George, Prince George's County, uh, where the door, uh, it was a, was a, a walkout basement, a uh, small fire in a walkout basement, wind-driven, uh, and the fellows uh, caught, got caught in a flow path to such an extent that the wind blew the do front door shut, and uh, both of them were seriously burned. If I can kind of put you on the spot there, Dan. No, uh, that, it was a, a pretty um, terrific fire in, in the outcome of what, what occurred. Uh, but, you know, it came back to, and ironically, that was a fire, if I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 57th Avenue. It was the same street where they had a fire that was a significant event a couple of years earlier that uh, windows were taken out of front, a small couch lit off, and some guys got burned. But, you know, that, those companies are very aggressive. They're very trained. They want to do their job. Uh, and this was a wind-driven fire where uh, whether it was lack of recognition or it was a ventilation issue or uh, a miscommunication like what uh, Mike was talking about with uh, D.C., 
Uh, I mean, the greatest companies, but a miscommunication, identification of fire when they're taking the top of steps, fire comes up the stairs 18 miles per hour. Those guys can't get out of the way of it. Very similar to happened to PG where you have a wind-driven fire to residential, which, you know, obviously in this, this region we learned when Kyle Wilson got killed. Uh, wind-driven fires can happen to residential application. Uh, but, you know, and those guys uh, in that fire that you're exactly right, that front door slammed closed. Uh, one of the guys got burned. I remember, right, it was right below a bay window. Fortunately, because of the aggressive, uh, well-trained nature of the guys who came to rescue him, they were able to pull him out. But you know, we, we get in this misnomer of thinking that in a single-family dwelling that maybe is 1,200 square feet big, that oh, we can't get in trouble there because it's so small. But you know, fire always gets a vote. It doesn't care. You're paid volunteer, aggressive, not aggressive, small building, big building. We give it oxygen. It gets plenty of uh, you know wind from the exterior. Uh, we have delayed recognition or lack of recognition or communication. All those big things we see in the, in the top five, a line of duty deaths. And you know, this is another situation. And fortunately, uh, PG, like you know, Phoenix did, you know, they, they took the information, they shared it with the capital region. Uh, they learned from it. And we learned from it because it can happen in Fairfax today, just like it did in PG. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to take that information and incorporate it into our strategy and tactics before we ever get to the incident so that we're training on this and we know it's not a hypothetical we know it can happen again i want to i want to uh, reiterate kudos to uh prince george's county uh they are one of those departments like phoenix that when there is a a, a significant incident where somebody gets hurt or killed they don't sweep it under the rug they, they make it a lesson learned for everybody and then share it with the rest of the fire service. Uh, Chief Holwoman, Jason, uh, I said that I can't think of another fire that requires an ongoing size up as much as a basement fire, but I can also say this. I can't, can't think of too many fires that require a 360 size up more than a basement fire. Could you allude to some of the things that we would glean from a 360 that we may not see from the alpha side uh, that would be pertinent to a fire in the basement. Oh, absolutely. Uh, actually, my last fire as a captain uh, was a was a pretty good work in basement fire, and we did uh, we ended up doing two 360s on that because when we first got there, we had generalized smoke uh, on the on the Delta Charlie corner. Um, but it really wasn't showing significant signs of a basement fire right away. Um, it also really emphasized the importance of crew size and how we deploy to these particular basement fires, especially when you don't have an exterior entrance uh, like the fire that we had that day. Um, that's the, some of the things you want to look for, are wells uh, sh with, with smoke coming from those windows, uh, smoke coming from low areas as opposed along with the high areas. Uh, we can easily get focused on uh, what's at eye level and above, uh, but especially at nighttime uh, is where I see it get missed a lot. And we had a firefighter um, misread a building uh, at, in the middle of the night uh, during some cold weather where he thought we had an attic fire. But if you look down towards the where the band boards are um, and where the, where the platform was, it was you had a lot of smoke issuing from that low area where you've got to be uh, very cognizant of the fact that you've probably got fire at a lower area than what you normally might. Uh, looking at those exterior entrances, whether it's walk out or walk up. In our district, it's mostly walk up if we have an exterior entrance. Uh, but that particular fire, we had to, uh, once we got the door open and it got a little bit of ventilation, it was easier to identify. But it took two passes to to truly identify that as being a basement fire before we ended up deploying all those crews. Okay, great. Uh, just for our, our viewers, we got a late start today, and I apologize for that. Uh, if it's okay with you, Chief Halton, uh, can we go about another uh, 10 minutes or so? Would that be okay with you, sir? Yeah, that's great. That's okay. a great idea. We're good with it. We're good with it. Uh, yes. Jason Opelman, you mentioned a band board, um, also called a, a rim board in some cases. Uh, Sam, could you allude as uh, because I, you sent me some outstanding pictures uh, where you've uh, accessed a basement from the exterior by uh, removing the siding and penetrating that that ribbon board or band board. Would you uh, expand on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if we're if we have a stick build um, home, we can still go through it, but we're most likely going to have to uh, 
come down from the window. And then we're going to cut through most likely a two by 10 or two by 12. If we have truss construction, then it's going to be an open web, even though it'll be hand built on the edges, we're still going to have an opening in there that's built much like a shortened wall. And by coming down on that side, we can open that up and get access to the floor space. We can get access to some of those larger rooms uh, because basements aren't always going to be compartmented. And that's something we have to go from a compartmented area above to a compartmented area below or an open area, especially with the modern construction and the engineering marvels that they're using to build these large spans across the uh, great rooms in our basements. The other thing I would say about going into the banding is, if you can, try to go on the gable side of the home. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the truss construction, we're just going to look at a simplistic home for now, a box with an Alpha Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. <laughs> Got to go. All right, brother. Stay safe. All right. Uh, I'm going to continue with him. Uh, we're going to try to, in our next session, I'll have those pictures. I've also got some great pictures that uh, Tim Oak took from uh, the Chicago area where the brothers uh, broke the um, the brick, the face brick, the uh, brick facade off and uh, went through the, uh, the exterior wall and got right into the fire. Uh, now, we have window wells for basement windows. Uh, and I think next month uh, I've got a... a my, my guys and I came up with a, um, a nozzle that we can direct down into a window well and project the stream upwards. You know, the fire is up in the overhead of the basement. That's where the action is. And the problem is, is how do we get that stream into the window well and then up into the overhead? And that's a problem. Sam, that must have been a very short event because it looks like you're back with us, brother. Yeah, so somebody. You, you uh, want to continue where you left off? Yeah, somebody else took the uh, took the run for us. Um, what I'm saying is, if we look at the simplistic version of a home, there's going to be two walls that are going to be bearing with the uh, truss construction. And if we cut on that gable side, um, particularly if we take a window down, because now we have the supports that are holding the header of the window, so everything that comes out from underneath of it, going to on it. All right, brother. Well, we're going to get some pictures because we've, we've got a long way to go on this. Uh, just as a teaser for next month, we're going to be looking at some of those tactics. We're going to be looking at chopping a hole in the floor at, right at a threshold from an area of safety and operating a Bresnan distributor. Uh, cellar pipes. Cellar pipes, um, which uh, have been around for a long, long time. I remember before breathing apparatus. Uh, firefighters had to come up with some uh, very innovative methods. Uh, I remember riding with my dad in, in Chicago, and uh, it was very common for them to operate a line through a coal chute. And uh, so th there's a lot, lot of different approaches to this. Uh, Daryl, I can just talk briefly about the problem we have underestimating the stretch if our objective is to enter a large building uh, through the front door extend all the way to the rear to the basement stairs down the stairs and then back towards the fire at the front of the basement have you ever experienced a difficulty like that or a miscalculation in the length of line well um, we've talked a lot before and I'm one that isn't a big fan of pre-connected hose lines. I think that is one thing that can lead into stretching too short because those lines are often meant to go from the rig to the depth of a uh, house or apartment. And in these cases, you may be stretching to the rear of the building and then back to the front, which would require a lot longer line. And although many companies have some method to accomplish that it may be uh more complex than it needs to be adding hose to you know uh, a gated y or something like that um but getting back to the 360 and uh you know recognizing where where the fire is um 
not stretching a line until you see the or find the source of the fire is going to be a key component. And as I think about the basement fires I've been to, and we've had in almost every situation, it was stretched into the first floor and then later discovered it's in the basement. So that is one of the biggest problems there is not recognizing that it's in the basement for that initial line. But for the second line, now we have to really think about having an efficient stretch that isn't going to be complicated. And that well, may be an inch and three quarter line and it may, it may be a, a two and a half inch line. Daryl, you've had some tragedies and near tragedies in the Bay Area on homes that are built on a really steep mountainside, mountainside, uh, where it may be one or two stories in the front and like three or four stories in the rear. I know we lost a couple of brothers in um, San Francisco a few years ago. Have you yourself encountered that type of fire in the, in the, in the Oakland, in the San Francisco Bay Area? Oh, yeah. We've had many fires like it. My, myself, one of the first fires that come to mind, uh, when I was a nozzle firefighter on Engine 16, we in these neighborhoods may be tricky. You can't always tell that it, it's not a dramatically steep hill all the time. Sometimes uh, it's just the lay of the land. The grade may just go down 10 feet by the time it gets to the back of the house. And then you have, you know, two stories in the back and one in the front or three in the back and two in the front. But we got to a uh, fire where we we had heavy fire involvement on the on the uh, floor we were entering it was a two-story house there was fire on the first and second floor and when i look back at it uh as like chief norman said if you have heavy smoke and no visible fire you may have fire in the basement but one thing i've learned is if you have fire filling the doorway from floor to ceiling then the the fire is also likely to be below you because generally fire's not gonna be filling, it may fill a window like that, but not a doorway from floor to ceiling. And that's what was going on. And as we're trying to attack the fire, we're, we're just really not beating it back. We only made it about five feet in the, into the doorway when through my face piece, I can just see some black lines going, you know, through the orange flame, some black lines. And it turned out to be the, I thought, I think that's floor joists. Tell my officer behind me, hey, I, I don't think there's a floor in front of us. And it was kind of comical because he said, well, don't go any farther. He said, stay right here. I think this might be below us. And we couldn't tell because of the hedges and the adjoining houses. So we he went around, turned out there was another story below us. That's where the fire had originated. It was going top to bottom from there. We held our ground and just kept a line there, and they ended up surrounding and, and drowning it. But very lucky and the reason it's memorable is the small area of floor we had entered in the front door was a tile floor and burnt out underneath and really we should have backed up to the door but very lucky that we could have you know met our demise on that night but the real problem with these houses is one it's very difficult to recognize if the fires below you and the other, I know there's some Monday morning quarterbacks after some of the incidents that have uh, happened in the, in the Bay Area, but some of these are on such radically steep hill, hillsides, there is no option to go down the side and into a lower floor. You would have to rappel with rope to do that. And there's not always a staircase leading down to, to those areas. And you can't just let it go because it'll, the houses are so close together and full of trees and brush you'll end up burning up the entire neighborhood. And Daryl, the 360 is kind of out of the question, isn't it? Unless you've it's, got a drone? It's, it's, com it's completely out of, out of the question for some of them. The roads are quite windy, so sometimes companies coming in may have entered a street where you can see the, uh, the back of the house from, some, from vantage point. That's a good point. If That's a good point. Sam, since you got your mug up there, would you allude to the tests that were done by Underwriters Laboratory and the Chicago Fire Department on non-fire rated uh, lightweight floor assemblies in uh, Northbrook, Illinois, uh, specifically why we cannot rely on a thermal imaging camera to detect 
uh, dangerously high fire conditions below us? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I was actually um, fortunate because I've always had a little bit of heartburn with that study. Um, they kind of alluded to the fact that you would not be able to really tell with the thermal imager that you had the extent of fire that they did below them. Uh, and I got a chance to sit down with Majikowski and um, we talked about it. And I told him that I've always had heartburn with it because it was done in such a large open warehouse. The uh, thermal dissipation. Oh, give me a second. Okay, um, but we always have drafts. Uh, it's kind of like the nose in front of your face. Um, you always see it, but you learn to ignore it. So we always have air movement moving wherever we're at. And so I asked the question, I wanted to know what would happen if we put a box over that where we wouldn't get that draft and we wouldn't get that thermal dissipation, how different it would look. And when they reenacted the Cherry Hill Road fires that we were talking about earlier, uh, maybe eight months or a year ago, they did that and they've got different readings with the thermal imager. So the next question I asked is what type of floor? And he said it was that panelized wood. So we agreed that the temperatures below it would actually be warmer because we were getting reflection off the ceiling, which would provide a much cooler temperature. But I, I'm going to actually uh, talk about that to uh, quite a bit or in great detail when uh, one of the classes coming up. I, I just think of the single study and the thermal imagers, the ability for them to read can be very uh, misleading. I think the main point that we have to take from that is don't rely on the thermal imager to tell you if you're in danger or not. Sam, I know that you're heavily involved in thermal imager, and that's why I asked you, and uh, that could be a subject in of itself. We're going to wrap this up and with some final closing thoughts or comments, starting with Chief Halton. Sir, any wisdom, words of wisdom for? Uh, students of the fire service no I, I think this is an excellent discussion i'd also uh, our good friend joe pernesti shot us a note and uh, he recommended and i think bill if you take this into consideration perhaps devoting an entire section to talking about uh, below grade fires or basement fires uh, cellar fires in type three type buildings uh you know much like the back bay fire in boston and several other major fires we could we could list uh, for days, the, the fires that we, we know of because of their historical significance in nature. So I would bring that up. I'd also like to thank everybody for being here today and for coming out to teach at FDIC for me. I always appreciate that. And I uh, look forward to seeing everybody in about 42, 43 days uh, out there on the ground. Uh, we do have a lot of classes that are, are sold out already on the hands-on training side. Uh, some of the workshops are sold out already. So please, if you're going to register, don't hesitate too much longer. Uh, some of the classes have already been uh, sold out. So uh, thank you so much for your support. I think this is an important topic. To Sam's point, when we're talking about a thermal imager or any tool, uh, you know, you have to provide the best environment for that tool and, and a high level of skill and training that, that needs to go along with that tool. So an inspection hole is always a good idea whether you're using a thermal imager or whether you're just trying to find out if, if you've got fire beneath you or in the wall beside you and and, and again remember that uh, renovations and terracotta floors and uh, now we've got um, uh, radiant heat systems that are uh, inside of the many many homes today uh, so your heat signature can get uh, diluted and diffused uh, by all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, obstructions so I think that's another great uh, topic for, for future discussion, and, and I, I hope we pursue it. I, I, I wanted to thank the panel, and Kehoe's in particular, for allowing this panel to uh, meet every week. Uh, the discussions are amazing. Uh, you guys are fantastic. The, the level of preparation that everybody puts into it, I find to be just wonderful. And uh, I can't wait to see you all at FDIC. You know, maybe I'm patting myself on the back, Chief. But... You know, there's no kids here in this room. And we are lifelong students of the fire service that have our head and our heart in this job. And it'll be that way until way after we retire. So just well, being, being the youngest oh, member of the group at, at 29, I, I feel honored to be among you old people. Well, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, son. That's um, fuzzy math. Yeah. 
Clark Lamping, Captain Lamping from Las Vegas. Any final closing thoughts for us, sir? Um, yes, as far as basement fires goes, after listening to this panel, I'm glad I don't have to fight many basement fires. That's what I have to say about that. Um, but I would like to thank Chief Halton, and I would like to thank Fire Engineering for uh, picking me this year to speak. And uh, um, I can't wait to see everyone there. It's one of my favorite times of the year, right next to Christmas. All right? So... Brothers and sisters in uh, Internet land, have a good have a good month. We'll see you next month. Well, I've, I, I've seen some of your material. It's cutting edge, and it is such a problem facing the fire service. And here's something that doesn't necessarily burn, but off gases, but things don't have to burn to yep. more produce. We know this is true of these plastics. Yep. More people are killed by the smoke than by the fire all of the time. Chief Dan, any closing thoughts? Yeah. Um, I mean, basement fires, we, we, I don't think we even uh, touched the tip of the iceberg on this. But, you know, the, the main things I think we, we, to lead into the next conversation we have next month is really understanding is that delayed recognition is huge. And that delayed recognition by the citizen uh, because they don't recognize the fire. And if you don't have a house that's up to current code, like my 100-year-old house I live in, the smoke detectors aren't interconnected. So if the smoke detector is off in the basement, you're not going to hear until it gets to the third floor. So you have the delayed recognition when it comes with the citizens we serve, but also the delayed recognition with us and our rush to get through the front door because we've always done that, that normalization of deviance and understanding and appreciating the importance of that lap to gather that information so you can make the correct firefight is, is huge. Uh, and you know, we talked about a couple of different reports during the course of this uh, conversation and you know, I always get back to that George Santiana quote of, you know, those who don't study history are bound to repeat it. And we are giving these resourceful documents in which we can pay homage to these, these firefighters, just like us, who died in line of duty or got injured or killed in the same type of department, the same type of houses, and yet we continue to repeat the same error. So, you know, honor those people who have left us with the information they provided and incorporate that into your tactics because it can happen right here. Uh, it can happen in your department, it can happen in your home, uh, and we can never lose sight of that fact. That's It's vitally important. And I would end with, uh, again, like, uh, number one, Clark, congrats. Welcome to the club. Uh, great to have you teaching at FDIC. But thanks to Bobby and Diane and the whole group. It is an absolute privilege and honor to be able to, you know, have a platform to share information that we are, uh, we're able to at FDIC. And it is the greatest show on earth. I'm going to ask Bill Carey if he could possibly post some links to the Underwriters Laboratory tests to um, uh, Governor's Island, uh, to Ch Cherry Road, uh, to the incident that occurred in Prince George's County just recently. Uh, and that, uh, boys and girls, will be your homework assignment that will be due next month when we come back for the next discussion. Daryl, any closing thoughts? Yeah, uh, the main thing is that where there's smoke, there's not always fire. There's fire somewhere, but if you if you are having trouble finding the location of the fire, if you're in command, call additional resources. If you um, are having trouble finding the fire and you're on the inside, make sure you let somebody know you can't find it and check below you because the fire is often... Uh, not in that location. So that's really uh, about it. I'll see you guys. Uh, Word to the wise, my brother. That is excellent. Excellent advice. Sam, anything? Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I would just say I'm glad that we're going to continue this because um, this is definitely an animal within itself. Um, you know, we have search considerations. We have ventilation issues. And so, um, and even when we get into uh, vests, uh, that that becomes a whole nother element, whether we're breaking glass or trying to leave it intact so that we can isolate that basement and the communication that goes along with that becomes even more important. And and I say that from being where we live, you know, we can have as much to uh, five people living in that basement. And we have more and more people that are moving their uh, parents into their home. And where do the kids end up going? Sam, and then you get into off-campus housing. We, I mean, we've just scratched the surface here. We've just scratched it. We've got a long way to go. Chief Hovelman, Jason. Yeah, just uh, thanks again for having me on. And I can tell you, um, basement fires take on a whole different perspective when you, you're standing outside deploying your people into them as opposed to being the first one off the engine. 
and going into them, you've got a completely different take on it. Um, but a couple of things that I've learned over the years that have been very helpful is number one, be patient. Uh, Daryl kind of alluded to it is uh, you can't rush into these things when you're suspecting a basement fire. There's a lot of things to consider and it doesn't mean you're not doing anything. It just means you've got to have some tactical patience and how you're going to deploy to make sure that you've got enough people to move the hose if you're going to take it on the interior. Uh, and then the second thing that really is critical that um, we pay, I pay a lot of attention to is be very judicious in how, when, and where you ventilate if you're going to put people in that basement. Because if you can't get water on the fire almost immediately or really quick, you've got to be very careful about where you open up. Next month, uh, I'm going to be asking you, you chief fire officers, uh, because you've been company officers before, uh, the difference in uh, the conditions as observed from the inside is uh, on a hose line or uh, working as a truck company and the observations from outside as an incident commander and how sometimes they don't, they don't compare. They're not in agreement. Uh, Captain Mike, any closing uh, thoughts, sir? My closing thought is basement fires. Have a plan. Whatever your plan is for your department, so everyone is on the same page. So everyone knows this is what we're going to do at Basement Fires. This is how we're going to do things. And I think that needs to be done where the incident commander knows what the plan is going to be. The company officer says, we have a basement fire. We're going to go at it this way or we're going to go. And you can have mutual things that you can do, but that depends on what the officer sees and what the chief sees, and have that plan. And as Darrell said, uh, where there's smoke, there's not always fire. And if there's smoke and there's no fire, it means it's probably below you, and you are above that fire in the collapse zone, and that building is decaying. So be aware of what you're doing and have an idea and a plan. All right, until next month, Kehoes, thank you so much. Thank you for letting this happen. Uh, again, it's an easy endorsement for me because that's the hose that uh, my department uses. We just bought 10,000 feet of it. And I'm very happy about that because you can't find better hose. And I challenge you to get some samples and try to kink that hose. I'm speaking specifically of their high-end model, the Combat Ready. But every grade of key hose is excellent. Everything that comes out of that plant in Dothan, Alabama is of the highest quality. So thank you very much, Key. Uh, brothers and sisters, students of the fire service from North America and around the world, thank you for participating. Stay safe, stay healthy, and God bless you and keep you safe in our most noble profession. <laughs>